share their stories and control their own narrative. Thank you, Jaha. Um, I also want to congratulate you on your recent um, L'Oreal Paris um, Award. Um, you are now the new face and spokesperson of L'Oreal Paris International. Uh, I remember seeing that um, about a month ago, and as well as resharing it on my socials, I had to personally message you and say, hey, well done. This is brilliant. <laughs> this is like brilliant stuff, not only for Gambians, but really just for women everywhere. No, I mean, absolutely. I think like society tends to put us in a box. Society tends to um, think that we can only be one thing and cannot choose. Like if I'm an activist, for instance, people want to see just an activist. But I think the reason why I decided to take the L'Oreal um, International Spokesperson Endorsement Deal is the fact that not a lot of people from Africa, especially a small country like Gambia with my background and my story, make it as far as I do. And I want girls in our community to know that everything I am is attainable for them. I want when they see me, they know that being an international sports person for L'Oreal like Eva Langoria or a person like Beyonce is not um, something that they can never attain in their lives. And it is something that they too can be and you don't have to be one thing. You don't have to, if you choose to be an activist, that's not all you need to be known for. So mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, at first, L'Oreal is not the first company that has reached out to me that wanted me to represent their brand or do things for them. But I've mm -hmm. always been cautious about it because I think for years, I didn't want to commercialize myself. I didn't want to commercialize my brand. Mm -hmm. But then you get to a point where you realize that if your values and the company that is asking you to do that is the same, L'Oreal mm -hmm. is known for their women's empowerment stuff and the things that they do. And I share those same values. And ever since I started my activism journey back in 2015, L'Oreal was the first company that gave me an award on my work on FGM. And ever since then, they've been super supportive and mm -hmm. um, they've been on the journey with me. Every time I'm doing something or every time I'm in New York or I'm in Paris, they're always involved and actively care about the work that I do. Mm -hmm. And to me, you know, it wasn't just about being a face of a makeup brand, but as a young African, like I know our continent and I know our people. By becoming a brand for L'Oreal, I get to rep represent that identity. I mm -hmm. get to represent my blackness, my Africanness and everything that we are. And yeah. even push for products that are catered towards us, being that they're the biggest cosmetic brand in the world. So mm -hmm. I think it's a huge opportunity for us and um, I'm very excited. Absolutely. Um, so Jaha, a lot of people um, are familiar with the work that you do and with your organization as Safe Hands for Girls. But in order um, for us to better understand, I'm keen to kind of go back to the very beginning and where it all started. And I want to start by asking, who was Jaha as a young girl before everything happened, before the FGM, which we'll talk about in a moment, and before the child marriage, which we'll get into in the second part of the show. Who was Jaha as a young girl? So I think a lot of people that remember me from my childhood will tell you that I was um, very stubborn. Um, <laughs> Before I left the Gambia um, back in 2015, uh, no, 2005, around 2004, 2005, I attended and that was comprehensive. And um, I was always an organizer, which is definitely part of who I am. I mean, I got into a lot of troubles because I was always, I, I, I was just always troublesome. I was um, part of Lend a Hand Society from a young age. And I think Lend a Hand in a lot of ways built me into who I am today. And, um, you know, and those, if we had every days, I was part of the organizers. If we had talent shows, I was always performing. And I remember there was a time that Mrs. Ndau suspended me and then expelled me for senior secondary. And she said, it was myself, Yamafai, our whole clique. Mrs. Ndau said, uh, may God rest her soul, said we mm -hmm. wouldn't come back to Ndau's because of just how troublesome we were. I mean, I, I have very happy childhood memories. My mother's from Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I grew up in a big family with my mom and my dad and my siblings. And, um, you know, I draw a lot of my strength from my mom. And I think I'm more like her than anything else. She was um, an amazing woman. And she was um, 
you know, she was everything. And, um, you know, growing up, I was very happy. I was very assertive. I was the troublemaker. I questioned everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I remember when I was a kid, I would question my dad, why do you have more than one wife? I would feel bad whenever something didn't go well at home. So I was never content with the things that I saw that I didn't think were just. I never liked the idea of the caste systems that we have in our communities. I always, something in me, and I don't know why, but I think I came into this world that way. So very inquisitive. Very. <laughs> now, so in going on to the topic of FGM, I'd like you to first of all explain what it is to anybody watching that doesn't know, and also the different types and levels to it, because there are different types, aren't there? Yes, yeah, so I think um, with FGM, there are three types of FGM that are known. Mm -hmm. And in the Gambia, um, Type 1 and Type 2 are the ones that are mainly practiced. And then in the Fula and Sarahulia communities, they practice Type 3. But female genital mutilation, basically in Wolof, they call it Haraf. In um, um, Sarahulia and in um, Fula, a lot of people also refer to it as Sunnah. And then in Sose, I think they call it Nya. Nya. Um, I'm not good in Sose, so I'll just leave that alone. Um, so, yes, but is the partial or total removal of the female genitalia. And, um, you know, FGM can go anywhere from cutting part of the clitoris to cutting all of the clitoris as well as the labia. And, um, you know, in extreme cases where a woman is sealed and in a place like Gambia, they do what they call fata, where in your own tissue is used to, um, your own tissue is used to do it. But in places like Somalia, Tones are actually used to stitch the female genitalia together, which is the, ex the most extreme form that I've seen. Mm. Um, fortunately, I've never seen or heard of a case like that in the Gambia, but in places like Somalia, in Sudan, yes, that happens. So personally, I went through FGM when I was one week old, but it's not something that I remember going through. So I can't say that I have any trauma from going through FGM. I can't say that I have any memories of going through FGM because I don't. And I only found out about it when I was um, about 15 years old. That was um, during my first marriage. And that's when I actually knew what this practice meant. But unlike other cultures or um, tribes that have ceremonies and parades and all of those things. I'm a Sarahule, so in my um, culture, we don't have that. When a baby is born, they go through FGM almost right away. So it's part of, um, I guess, the naming ceremony or whatever, or right after that, or even sometimes before that. So yeah, pretty much that's it. And is there, you, you know, it's obviously a very painful experience. Is there any form of anesthetic or anything that's given for the pain at all? No, I think with FGM, I mean, it's like the way male circumcision is performed in the Gambia to this day. Um, it's usually not even done by doctors or um, midwives. It's usually done in traditional settings. And these are people that have no knowledge of the female anatomy or what they are cutting or what it represents. Mm -hmm. And there's usually no anesthesia or no numbing. And um, I mean, people that remember what they've been through they've expressed the traumatic and the psychological effects that it has had on them. And, you know, I can't say that about myself because like I said, I was too young to even remember anything. So, yeah. Yeah, you must have surprised quite a lot of people, especially in our communities. We know what it's like when you revealed your own unpleasant experiences about FGM. Tell us about some of the reactions that you received. Um, God, um, you know, the thing about Gambia is, and Africa in general, when you come out and speak against something like FGM, to them, it's always about the West. It's always the fact that you're doing it for money, you're doing it for fame, or you're doing it to seek attention, and that you are this, you are that. And to me, it was rough at the beginning. I mean, mm -hmm. people within my own family, um, 
you know, stopped talking to me because of the work that I was doing. I remember when I lived back in Atlanta, um, for years I was like ostracized by our society. For that reason, I think to this day, the reason why I don't like going to naming ceremonies, the reason why I don't like going to family gatherings or even weddings, I'm not that type of person. You will never find me. Even if I show up at an event, I'm only there for like two minutes or five minutes and then I'm gone. It's because of the way people treated me because whenever, even our mosque that we prayed in, whenever I went to the community mosque, the way people looked at me, the way people treated me, the way people talked about me. And to me, I think that was like one of the most painful periods in my life because the people that I expected the most amount of support from were the people that were against me the most from my own community to my own family to my own um you know sometimes even friends and you know i heard the things that they said and you know it was about people telling me what my intentions are it was about people defining why i was doing what i was doing mm -hmm. and without ever taking a moment to understand where this was coming from and why and to this day, you know, sometimes when things are posted about me online, I see the comments that people make and people continue to define who I am for me. And I think from early on, one of the things that I've always done is I control the narrative of who mm -hmm. Jaha is, why Jaha is doing what she's doing. And the people that are fortunate to know me and be close to me, they understand that. So yeah in a lot of ways i'm grateful for the ones that have stood by, by me a lot of gambians have supported me a lot throughout the years i mean to mention someone like auntie tukulo c i've never met her but mm -hmm. she's um one of the most i think genuine gambians that i know that is constantly supporting and doesn't just judge someone without knowing them and a lot of sisters a lot of people that I have met and that I have not met yet that um, have constantly supported me and given me strength moments when I felt like giving up moments when I felt like, you know, this is not something that I can do because I have a choice. I can, you know, I think what Gambians fail to realize is I'm not uneducated. I'm not some random girl that needs to do FGM in order to survive. I was a successful banker before mm -hmm. I started working on FGM. I worked for one of the biggest banks in the US. So I left my job to start this work on FGM. And when I did at the time, I used my own money to do the work that I was doing. A lot of times when I attended events, when I first started, no one paid me to do that. I would book my own flight and go to Congress in the US, um, do campaigns and posters. My best friend, Hadi, who shares a name with you, Hadi Mbo, um, she was there, like when I sold most of my gold in order for me to do this work. How do you remember it? There are times when I starved myself in order to be heard. And a lot of times people assumed, I remember during those times when I started my position, a lot of Gambians assumed, you know, she's getting paid to do this. She's, you know, this and that and that. And none of that is true. When mm -hmm. I, like the documentary film that was made about me, I mean, being that you're in the UK and you know how journalism works, you know that they don't pay anyone in order for them to film you. If the story is true, you will never give, get paid for that. No, and no. You unless, know that it's, unless it's magazine, gossip or a gossip, gossip magazine. Exactly. So yeah. in magazines and like from the Guardian to the New York Times, you know very well that you never get paid for stuff like that. No, so I have right. never been paid for media interviews that I did early on for my career mm -hmm. or anything that I've ever done. Mm -hmm. Just to be extremely transparent, because I think one of the reasons why I agreed to do this is to just open up so that um, Gambians and the people that probably don't know me, so they get a better understanding of, you know, how Jahan came about, how did she get to this point. Mm -hmm. Between 2015 and I would say to 2000 and 2015 to 2000 and, no, 2013, between 2013 all the way to 2016, 17, around that area. I didn't have anything, you know, because I left my job. I had no health insurance. My kids had no health insurance. And I focused on building safe hands. And the people that supported me from Safe Matijau to Sanasar to a lot of the young Gambians that 
you know, came together with me to build this movement and what we were doing. And a lot of times it came at a personal cost to me. It came at a huge personal cost to me because, you know, in my family, in my marriage, everything, like I felt like everything collapsed around me. And once the work started picking up pace, universities and big conferences started inviting me to come and speak. Mm -hmm. But by then, we have done the work for years. And I think at that point, because people saw me as a top leader, and as a result of that, I started getting paid for my speaking engagements, and I started getting approached by companies like Pirelli to be on their calendar, and those are things that I started getting paid for. For instance, with my role with the UN Women, it's a political appointment. I don't get paid for stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm a, like the role that I have with UN Women is unpaid. So if Gambians thought that I, I'm at the UN and I'm making a lot of money based on Oh, FGM, you're doing this for money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So I started working for the World Bank around 2016. And I don't even think a lot of Gambians know that. And um, I took the job within World Bank in order for me to be able to support the work that I was doing with Safe Hands. And a lot of times I know that my Safe Hands team is watching this and they know this fully well. When I do a lot of these big things, I have an office in the Gambia and everyone that works in that office is under the age of 35. We have about 16 full-time employees. And to me, it was important that we were not just a youth organization that paid our per diems. To me, it was important that we paid these people a decent salary. I mean, I proudfully, I can say that I think we're one of the organizations that pay the highest salaries in the Gambia. And that is something I am not ashamed of. It is mm -hmm. something I am very, very proud of because at the end of the day, I don't think just because you care about an issue, you should do it for free. Yes. So yes, when I go out in the world and I do mm -hmm. my speaking engagements and I work for the World Bank and I have all these high paid consultancies, I use that money and I reinvest it right back into my communities. And that is something that I don't feel bad about. Mm -hmm. And I earned it. I educated myself in order for me to be an expert, not only on the issue of FGM, but on women's economic empowerment. Mm -hmm. And no one can ever make me feel bad or bow down because of that. And you shouldn't, you absolutely, you absolutely should not. Um, Jaha, just back to the topic of FGM. The issue for, for me and um, in kind of understanding this, the, the, this um, practice is that we all know that you know our mothers, our parents, they love us and they wouldn't do anything intentionally to, to harm us. Yeah. Um, so is it about society? Is it about education or lack of education? Is it about um, trying to control women and their bodies? Talk us through the reasons why FGM, <laughs> excuse me, FGM takes place. So FGM is a deep rooted traditional issue and mm -hmm. I don't think it comes from a place of hate. I don't think anyone, any parent knowingly puts their child through something that would harm them. And I think mm -hmm. in our activism, we need to admit that. I think the problem that we have in the, when it comes to FGM is the fact that it's been around for years and years and years. And a lot of times issues that impact women are sweeped on the rug and no one really talks about it. And mm -hmm. um, as a result of that, our pain we don't talk about the things that we feel we are thought that we have to moon. Yeah. so i think when i came out um i started talking about fgm it wasn't something that was traditional because we're not used to women talking about their vaginas and here is this sarahule girl that is mm -hmm. out there in public talking about her own experience of fgm and how she feels about it and people were not okay with that and it's understandable but the reason behind fgm when you look at the history of FGM or where it comes from, you realize that even though our people don't get that, but it doesn't come from a place of love. Um, the first instances of FGM that we hear about in um, religious scriptures, as well as um, historically, it's because of the Pharaoh used to do it on slave women, just so that they can't give birth, especially when he had that prophecy about Musa. And then, the second time, uh, well, even before that, it was with Prophet Abraham's wife, wherein mm -hmm. she put her um, co-wife through circumcision so she doesn't enjoy sex as much as she does. 
And then to this day, a lot of times people think that FGM is Sunnah and it's religious. But then you go to a place like Saudi Arabia, they don't practice FGM. You go to a place like Lebanon, they don't practice FGM. You look at all these Muslim countries around the world, from Lebanon to Syria to Morocco to a lot of the Muslim countries um, in places like um, the Emirates and all of these Muslims, they don't practice FGM. And it doesn't make them any less Muslims. So because I received a lot of comments for fighting against Islam, because I think in, in a place like Gambia, one of the biggest reasons why FGM continues is because a lot of people believe that it's a religious obligation and they're doing it to please Allah. And when people believe that they're doing something for the sake of Allah, it is very hard for you to fight that. So which is why as activists, we need to do everything that we're doing from a place of love and from mm -hmm. a place of understanding. Mm -hmm. So when I continue to receive this notion that, you know, she's fighting Islam, she's this, she's that. I traveled to Egypt as a um, university, Sheikh al Azadi have the highest authority when it comes to Islamic jurisprudence. And I met with the Grand Imam of Egypt and we had a conversation about FGM. Mm -hmm. And what he told me is, FGM should not be practiced in Islam because who determines the sunnah that people keep quoting of Ummu Athiya, wherein the Prophet said, if you have Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet said, if you have to cut, cut a little. But one, they said that that had, hadith is not authenticated. And the mm -hmm. second issue is who determines what is too much to cut and who determines what is a little to cut. And a lot of the people that are doing the cutting have no idea what they're cutting and the benefits of it. And a lot of times, if it's about to lessen a woman's sexual desire, in the Gambia here, I'm not giving you, but you have to say, 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 why a woman is a woman or a woman is a woman. How do you understand me? At the end of the day, I'm not giving you, you have to say, and they're living their life. Domi Adam no yare sa dom, ak no ko wone dine, ak loko jangal, sa dom values yo yon la mo jil ameko. It has nothing to do with you cutting um, her clitoris to make her faithful to her husband or to ensure that she becomes a virgin until she gets married. And I think we need to have this honest conversation. Um, Within our communities, we need to have this honest conversation within ourselves and realize mm -hmm. that is the values that we instill in our children is mm -hmm. what we teach them about who they are and why they should be the way that they should be. You teach them about Sundine, you won't learn, you have a lens and boba, who jigging, who won't respect boba, who ham boba, ham lana wara def, agla laboruta def. Why ne put ne put jilsa dom, dugal pull lil, lone way tasta dom, we yaru. It has, it, has it, has it has absolutely nothing mm. to do with mm. that. For me, see, and I think that's the reason behind, like in the social language, for instance, they call women that have not been through FGM Solimas. And back in, the day, back in the day, it used to be a word to say that like, if you're a Solima, it means that you're untrained. So it was a, you're you on, know, sorry? a untrained like the yaro law so i think it was come time bo hamante na dañ plan wax olof yi like um surwa because guy doing they them little ak you know but then you realize like right now globally we're in a time where you know we're talking about black lives matter right we're talking about all of these things and it's very important that we are having these conversations i think i'm so happy to see the awakening that the world is going through Mm -hmm. But within ourselves, we need to have a serious conversation about, you know, these terms and what they represent. Like you looking at someone in Nako Oye Ki Solimala or Ki Lila or Ki Lila just because Harafalunko, man gisna hale yo hamantene nyo gina yarusi adna bite jarun through lil. Gisna jigil yo hamantene nyo gina lil nita denilan put through lil at the end of the day it's about who make acts of personality but women have a right to enjoy sex as much as men do i Absolutely. mean i would say something when i went through fgm and i got married at the age of 15 i had no idea that women could enjoy sex mm -hmm. but when i started my fgm activism i found out about um a reversal surgery that they do on women they hang on man like literally man everyone that knows me 
So I decided, you know what? Like, what's the risk anyway? Why don't I just figure out what this is? Because I have a lot of American friends. I grew up in the U.S. And a lot of times when I'm having conversations with them, a lot of the things that they talk about, I'm like, I have never experienced that. So I went through a reversal surgery. It's basically, I think one thing that people need to understand about the female anatomy is that the clitoris is actually mostly internal. Mm -hmm. And like in the Sarahule tribe, when they cut everything off, so there's a surgery technique that has been developed by a, girl, um, by a man called Dr. Pierre Folds in Paris. And basically what he's able to do is they're able to get, reduce the scar tissue, create an opening and pull out a bit of the clitoris. So that way you're able to at least experience some sexual desire. And mm -hmm. as someone that has gone through this surgery, I would say it's one of the best things that I've ever done for myself because at mm -hmm. least this is my God-given right. And you cannot take that away from me. I don't care what yeah. anyone says about that, but uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and Jaha, again, um, you raise really significant points there about FGM being linked to Islam and, and it being a Sunnah. But for me, what is so profound for me is you actually explained in your documentary, uh, the girl who said no to FGM and to anybody watching that hasn't seen it yet, I highly recommend that you do. You explained how you saw uh, Michael Gove, who was education secretary here in the UK in 2014, um, yeah. bring in those policies in place that safeguarded um, survivors of FGM. And that inspired yeah. you to set up your own petition and from that, you know, the Guardian and other major institutions got involved. Then the Obama administration got involved. How, how did that feel how, that you were, you know, the, or one of the voices that really highlighted this issue on a national level? I mean, I think Elena Lagum, right? In Domi Adam Aluneka Yalala. They need to from Nugum Yal. Manyala Bilona Kanlai Neka before way before my job. The work that I do, even if I didn't want to do it, Yala the for already been on it, Jaha Dukuri Lila Modon. And when I started my FGM work, there has been people that have been doing this work for decades. Like people like Dr. Isidu Ture in the Gambia, Ami Bujan Sisoho, as well as globally, like Edna Adan from Somaliland, as well as very high prominent women that have dedicated their lives to this. But when I started my FGM activism, for some reason, the world listened and I was able to get global attention. It's not because um, I deserved it more than the people that have been doing it for years, but it will go yala moko to that. How many the understanding of what I'm trying yeah, to say. And for my petition to get the success that it did, no one knew who I was at the time. I was just this Gambian girl in Atlanta mm -hmm. and the Guardian to Equality Now to the White House to globally, it became a huge thing. And like, I would like to sit here and take credit for a lot of those things, but honestly, it wasn't me. It was God, it was in my destiny. It, um, everything that I am, I always tell people and my staff and volunteers that, you know, it's like I'm a passenger in a car that's been driven mm -hmm. and Allah has been the one that has guided me. Allah has been the one that has driven me and mm -hmm. everything that I am today is because of him. The accolades, the name, the successes, the, you know, the bitterness of the campaign as well as everything it's because this is my destiny it took me a long time to accept that that mm -hmm. everything that i'm doing the reason why i can't stop even when i want to stop is because of destiny and i think we were able to work with the white house and the obama administration to not get only get policies in place but to ensure that this issue becomes something that is on the global platform that leaders are discussing that it's not just an african problem where mm -hmm. in you know those people and their barbaric practices but controlling the narrative and showing it from a survivor's perspective because i think internationally the conversation was led by white people and people that don't understand mm. our culture people that don't they, have an, they had an experience it themselves exactly and they talked about it from a position of barbaric africans backwards africans and all of that mm. but when we took the narrative we showed that mm, no it's not about being barbaric it's not about being backwards 
and I think one of the things that I champion in the U.S. is to show them that female circumcision used to be something that was happening in the U.S. On the cover of Playboy magazine back in the 90s, they were promoting female circumcision. Mm -hmm. And to this day, women are doing cosmetic surgeries um, just to, for aesthetic purposes. They call them labiaplasties. And that's not any different from FGM. Okay. And I think, so for me, it's about calling them out on the hypocrisy of calling Africans backwards and this and that. And for that reason, it was important that we were the ones that have the lived experience as well as the expertise to be the ones that are leading the conversation in our communities globally. If there are decisions that are going to be made about FGM, we need to be at the table and we need to be leading and championing those conversations. If there are laws that are going to be made about our people, about our communities, we need to be involved in those policy decisions as well. It's not about talking about us without us. So mm -hmm. like, I think what we made clear is you're not going to continue having conversations about FGM without us. And we need to respect our families. We need to respect our parents. We cannot end FGM without respect. And I think we need to keep that in mind. Yeah. And again, with the documentary, the, the pivotal moment for me that really got me was when your father agreed to not carry out FGM on his youngest child, your, your youngest sibling at the time. Um, how, how did you feel in that moment? I mean, I think I when, when I was watching it, I was like, Alhamdulillah. No, I mean, in my family, like even with my siblings, I have older brothers and they don't practice FGM on their kids. Um, mm -hmm. My brothers are probably watching this right now. And um, so it gives me a lot of pride that, you know, because of the decisions that I made, early on, regardless of how difficult those decisions were, that it has had some impact on my family. Like all my, the daughters that have been through FGM would be, you know, one, two, three, it's one off. But ever mm -hmm. since I started doing this work on FGM, none of my siblings have put, and they still having kids, have put their mm -hmm. daughters through FGM. I know one of my brothers told his wife, if they um, put, his daughter through FGM, he would divorce the wife or something like that. And I look at my own daughter, Khadija, for instance. When I was Khadija's age, I had a husband. I was already promised to someone. And I look at Khadija and see that she has none of those things. Like, you cannot come to me and tell me, oh, the Mabuga Takasa don't be more. So I'll probably no. kill you yes. if you tell me that. So for me, it's about seeing how things have changed within my own family and within my own society. I mean, we were in Gambisara recently doing rice distribution. It's about the way perceptions are being changed. It's about when we travel across the Gambia, even mm -hmm. though majority of Gambians still believe in this practice, but it's a level of support that we are getting from communities and the fact that they appreciate the work that we're doing, the testimonies that we are hearing from women and mm -hmm. how they've decided that this practice ends with them. And mm -hmm. I believe that Gambia would end FGM. I think FGM would die a natural death in this country mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because back in the day, every summer we see kids being paraded around this country in their, you know, Dengina Lil and Kangurangs and all of that, girl children. Now mm -hmm. we still see cases of boys, but I, since I've lived in the Gambia in the past three years, I have not seen a single parade of circumcision in this country. So that in itself is victory for mm -hmm. all of us that have dedicated ourselves to this. Mm -hmm. So you talk about FGM um, not ending yet in the Gambia, but it has been banned and that was as a consequence of your campaign. How did that happen? So I was in the Gambia with the Guardian at the time and mm -hmm. um, President Jame, you know, no one really knew where that man stood when it comes to FGM because he didn't talk about it and I remember FGM was banned in like national TV discussions and radios and all of that and I remember knowing about Dr. Touris and I mean Bojang Sisoho's arrest and the, you know the way Gambia was at the time but like I said I go all the way so we were doing a media training at the time and I decided you know what I woke up one day and rented a car and told one of my camera people, let's, we found out that Jamie was on tour. And mm -hmm. I just told him, Louis, he's still a very good, he's one of my best friends. And my kids call him Uncle Tubab. When he comes to Gambia, he stays here. I, I remember telling Louis, um, let's just follow Jamie on tour. 
and see what happens. So we took our car and we drove all the way to Mansakonko. Jami was at Mansakonko at the time. And um, that day in itself, the NIA, um, well, not really arrested me, but they were wondering why I was following them and okay. um, why I was with um, the, a camera person, especially a white man. Mm. And it was the scariest experience of my life. Like the NIA guy that was always the one that was around Jame. And the way he intimidated me was one of the scariest moments of my life to this day. Mm. And even like thinking about his name or thinking about that experience in itself is um, something. But a few people that helped me during that tour was Lamin Manga, Mayor mm. Yankuba Koli. Mm -hmm. um, Yankuba Baji of the NIA director at the time, because I remember he called his people in Mansakonko and told them that he has my file and that mm -hmm. they should let me go. And they've been following me. They know what I'm up to. They know that the only thing I care about is about Jame. Uh, it's about FGM. I don't really care about politics or anything mm -hmm. like that. So I think then um, Yankuba Baji of NIA, as well as Lamin Manga, and a few of the ministers at the time, including Omar C, who was the health minister. Um, mm -hmm. And um, a, a lot of the ministers had my back. And, you know, when we arrived in Basse, so even after the NIA issue that I had, I didn't go back home. We still followed Jame to Basse. So when mm -hmm. we arrived in Basse, um, I think they had a conversation with Jame. And Jame asked all his ministers that were present during that tour to have a meeting with me from Mama Fatima Sinate to all of them, I had a conversation with them. And then, you know, they reported back to Jamie what I said and why I was following him and why I wanted to meet him, with him. So I had a conversation with Jamie. And then while I returned back to Serakunda, I mean, the conversation wasn't an easy conversation because I remember Mama Fatima Sinate, for instance, um, mm -hmm. the night that I had to sit down with them told me that, um, their mothers have been through FGM. We've been through FGM, our sisters. How do we criminalize a practice like that? And I remember leaving the meeting very hopeless. And um, I returned back to Sarakunda. When I returned, um, I was called and told that my children were involved in a car accident in Atlanta. So I took a flight to Atlanta that same day. And when I arrived in Atlanta, luckily my children were okay. And, but then I received a call from Lamin Manga. And he said that Jami was about to make a big announcement and he wanted me there. So um, I jumped on another flight again, back to Gambia the same day. So between, I was away for about a day and a half. So I took a flight that night with Brussels and came all the way back to Gambia and then met with Jami in Kanilai after the announcement was made and my team and I were present in there. And uh, my cousin Fatimata Jawara, who was very supportive around the time was also there and I think that basically became how the FGM ban came about and then a law came about which we worked with various ministries the women's bureau as well as the health ministry so I think behind the scenes a lot of people didn't realize that this took a lot of work we worked mm -hmm. with KMC we worked with Banjul City Council we worked with the health ministry the education ministry the justice ministry at the time people like Lamin Manga, people like, um, I can't remember who the SG was at the time, but all of those people were involved and they supported me at that time. And mm -hmm. to this day, I am grateful because in a way I feel like they saved my life as well. Because mm -hmm. I could have been one of the people that they're discussing at the TRRC if those people didn't step in and explain to Jamie that, you know, she's not political. She has mm -hmm. no interest in any of those things. So, in a lot of ways, I am very grateful because I think that I am partially alive because of them. Okay. Now, Jaha, we're going to move um, on to the second part of the show, which is about child marriage. Um, child brides and child marriage is something that is deeply disturbing for, 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 for a lot of us. Um, around 700 million girls around the world right now are forced into marriage and sex and having children while they're still children themselves. And in Sub-Saharan Africa alone, we've seen that almost 40% of women are married before they turn 18. Uh, you found out yourself, Jaha, that you were engaged when you were just eight. You moved to America um, to be with him uh, when you were a teenager. 
when, when, when did you realize that you were too young to be married? And I ask this because I think um, from my experience, certain things happen. And at the time, I don't really realize that, okay, this is wrong or this shouldn't have happened. But it takes a while later for you to then say, okay, this, you know, th th this is something that is wrong and shouldn't have happened. So when did you realize that you were too young to be married? I mean, I was never okay with the idea of me having a husband. Um, mm -hmm. People that knew me at Naus would tell you that um, I was very stubborn in school. I was always causing troubles. So there was a time that um, I think we were in grade eight or grade seven that um, something happened at school and I was either suspended or my parents had to come to the school. My mother was still alive. And, um, you know, I remember she came to my class and told everyone that I have a, like, I have a husband and um, that like the boys should stay away from me because I was like I ever since I was young I was always with the boys and um you know like um jumping the fence going to Mango Island doing like everything bad that you can think of I was probably part of it and my mom like when my mom was tired of all the mess that I was getting involved in in school she just came to my class and basically told everyone that she's married and I remember being so mortified um, mm -hmm. at that age because like I was just a teenager I you know had you know maybe someone that I had a crush on at the time every girl <laughs> experiences that and um, so imagine my mother coming to that same class and telling everyone including that boy that you know she's married and mm -hmm. for days I couldn't go, go back to school and I remember when I finally went back to school I started wearing Ibaru um, I don't know why but I think I've put on the Ibadu for like two weeks where in the day I changed my uniform, you know, Nandos uniform, how short it is. Then it was all the way to my, um, it was all the way down. And then I started wearing these big colors. But then after two weeks, I took it off and shaved my head because I realized that's not who I am. Like, it's not I don't know why. And my mother, I, my mom was still that during this time. And I remember she, Insult a bastard, like Luther, like not the damn devil of a magenta lapis. You as you want the uniform, you as you think that I got Ibadu, not a guinea car. Like she was so furious when I did that. But just that just shows you, like, like I've always been this way. Mm. It's not something that started. But the idea of child marriage was never something that was okay with me. And being that I was a member of Lunday Hand Society. We, from a young age, they instilled certain values in us. And I remember um, we used to have, like, say, say Jalo of Giatrias. We used to have children's TV with say Jalo. And I would always bring out the issue of child marriage in that show because I knew that I was going to be a bride. All my sisters before me married off at a really, really young age. But for me, the reason why I think child marriage is even more painful than FGM is a child cannot consent to sex and when you force a girl to get married you've given someone the right to rape her and i hate the idea of not having a say on who you become intimate with and i think a lot of times people don't realize that's a trauma that you never get over personally mm -hmm. when i think about myself yes the fgm stuff i mean i've had reconstructive surgery i've I'm over it. Like I'm just campaigning so that it doesn't happen to my daughter and girls like her. But the child marriage stuff is something that I can never get over. It's something that I would never forget. It's something that I would never heal from. And it has shaped me. It has um, shaped a lot of who I am in the way I think. I mean, to this day, I still have, I would say that one of the worst anxieties, like I, mm -hmm. people that are close to me would tell you that, I suffer from anxiety attacks a lot. I am constantly on Xanax and pills. And a lot of that is rooted in the experiences that I had as a child bride. And mm. the fact that I was forced to live with that and not talk about my pain and just accept that as the normal because my sisters have been through it and no one else is complaining. I don't have any right to be against it. I couldn't make that choice whether, you know, whether I was happy or not, I forced myself to smile and just accept that. So mm. to me, it's like, you don't get over that and you don't just forget about that experience. And to this day, it's really, really bad because 
I get messages online all the time from girls, be it on Instagram or on Snapchat or even on Facebook, that are constantly telling me how ha unhappy they are. Sometimes it's their parents want them to marry their cousins in order for them to give them papers. Sometimes it's um, they've already been forced to marry someone and you know they they feel trapped and they don't know what to do like one thing we need to realize is as young gambians we are very obeying to our parents to this day mm -hmm. i am i mean like for instance mm -hmm. like gerald mm -hmm. that might go against lumawa even today that i'm in pain be if my dad doesn't want something i have so much respect for him that i would accept that so which is why in my work we plead with parents we mm -hmm. show them that um, positive role models in our communities. Just because of Don Mujigin, then Kok Bai Mujanga Be Pare, Dutah Mu Banyasi, or Dutah, because a lot of times, I post this on mm -hmm. my Facebook or even on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of them, they delete some comments because they don't want to say that they don't want to own Domi, they buy Domi Janguri. They don't want to say that Domi, like literally. It's like people don't think I have kids and people think that mm -hmm. I'm against marriage or anything. Man can get with my book a fairy tradition, a fairy culture, a fairy say. Mm -hmm. But children cannot consent to sex, period. It's the, it has to happen at the right time. Exactly. It has to happen at the right time. And how you get it? And mm guy told you for and much one, they're able to make better decisions, make mm -hmm. conscious choices and help their community. So man, that's my thing. Mm -hmm. So, Jaha, clearly um, you and I condemn this practice, um, but some people don't feel the same way. Um, and, and I just want you to talk us through the reasons why this happens. You know, is it about money? Is it about financial security? Um, we've seen in some cases where the bride price really can transform some families' lives. I mean, I think the root cause of a lot of our issues is poverty. Mm -hmm. And girl children are more like burdens on their families. Like Sangha so say you you have to be at home and your parents have to take care of you. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times don't but again then call here to move them say but we don't actually see women as people that can contribute to society or people that can add value to society. So jigin plus I'm see negam la acti wine be. So I think a lot of times, but sometimes it has nothing to do with money. Like for instance, Newton family, Newton tradition. When small young papa knew when diamond traders in Sierra Leone at Angola, so it had nothing to do with money. It was more about preserving tradition and culture. It was more about come the hunger so don't budge again. So age time is saying, "Come what are you going to say?" You must send parents to learn and then get to meet them. I mean, my baby sister lives with me and um, she made that choice to who she gets to marry. And um, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's like seeing that those traditions are changing. So yes, sometimes money is a contributing factor, but other times it's not. It's, not it's more yeah. about gacha be because so be it is see you law. Gacha bo 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 I think but it's so money, sad how, yeah. um, you know, it's like regardless of what you achieve, and I had this conversation with my friends, um, it's regardless of whatever you achieve, it's, you, you know, it's still not good enough. If you're not married, it's not. No, it's, exactly. If you're not married or if you decide to leave a marriage or whatever the situation is, mm -hmm. society can't accept that because to nyom, like you're you're only as good as you being someone's wife mm -hmm. or you being someone's daughter or you being someone's mother as a woman that's all you'll ever be mm -hmm. you cannot mm -hmm. be an individual and i think mm -hmm. that in itself is very problematic but the thing that we need to talk about is how do we ensure that we delay marriage for girls how mm -hmm. do we give them the same opportunities that we give our sons yeah. how do we lift women out of poverty how do we economically empower them? And I think this is the conversation that I've been having. We've mm -hmm. shifted our work a little bit to focus more on the economic sides of it because mm -hmm. money is power, whether you like it or not, whether mm -hmm. you admit it or not, but money is a powerful tool. And if we're able to, if we're, um, if we're able to empower women and show them girls like you and I, 
for instance, mm -hmm. that are doing our own thing and still connected to our culture, still connected to our home country, still connected to our people, so that they understand that when a woman makes money, she reinvests that money into her community. When a woman becomes someone, she not only becomes someone for herself, but she becomes mm -hmm. someone for her whole nation, for her whole continent, mm -hmm. for the whole world. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, good is to take here, we there, they know them take even in Jabba, or then call them Joh, Hale Jigeni, or Pisip Pasar, like that's what men do. But so set low, Jigen, so I made that. Jigen Lundi in the Kahalal, Nakalai Terra Les Mopapa, Nakalai Terra Les Mayai, Nakalai Terra Les Mamboka, Nakalai Dimba Les Maniti. And by us showing that there's more people like us, and that Tahud Mu Yahoo, Tahud Mu Banchun Ade, Tahud Mu Nekali or Nekalali, the more you continue showcasing positive stories within our country or within our continent, I think Lol did not have parents. You could say, Nanyone, okay, Mani Bugana small dom, Mumak, Mumel Nihadi, Bugana small dom, Mumak, Mu own network and comfort to Kamara, Bugana small dom, Mumel Nimama Linger Sar, Bugana small dom, Mumel Nesu to Reneka Vice President in Gambia. Lol, yep, that's the story that we need to tell. And, and again, it's, it's this issue of culture and, and how do you even begin, Jaha, to change a culture that doesn't even acknowledge when we talk about child marriage, we talk about consent. How do you begin to, to, to change a culture that doesn't acknowledge things like consent? We've seen what's happened so, early on in, um, with, with, with the case of Hadija, who was, who was a five-year-old that has been raped by her uncle. 90% of the comments that I've seen on social media are blaming the mom. They're saying, well, what did her mom do? Why was her mom not there? How, how do we change this culture? So when it comes to rape and child molestation, I don't know about people that are watching, but personally, I don't know any girl in this country that I grew up with that has not been molested at some point in their life, mm -hmm. including myself. I don't know of anyone. Whether you were going to school, teacher Bilal Sawani, or definitely, I don't know anyone that hasn't experienced that. Mm -hmm. And this is like man numaham. Man, how much can Kohaman then experience it through? A lot of times when we experience these things, we don't go to our parents and tell them that someone did this to us. Mm -hmm. We are ashamed because Hamdan yes, when we go over here, we will be blamed for allowing it to happen. So a lot of times you grow up with this and it's not any different with what's happening with our children. My daughter's name is Khadija and she sort of looks like the Khadija from Sierra Leone. And to this day, mm -hmm. I haven't been able to comment on it because every time I see her picture, I see my daughter. Mm. And um, if someone did that to my child, it would never get to the police because I would kill them before it gets to the police. Mm -hmm. And ever since we moved to Gambia, you know, I've been very protective of my daughter. Like, for instance, my sons can go um, for weekends in their dad's family house, but I don't let my daughter go. Even to my own dad's house, I don't let my daughter go. Mm -hmm. Because I'm constantly afraid of, you know, exposing her to the things that I was exposed to as a child. Mm -hmm. And I've sheltered her in a way where in sometimes I'm worried about, you know, what would happen because people don't understand consent yes mm -hmm. means yes and no means no and a lot of times you can't violate a child like that and you know we need to have these conversations so that like i have that conversation with my daughter she's 10 now mm -hmm. but like whenever like Khadija is so assertive even if she sits around you and you make her uncomfortable, she'll come to me and tell me, mommy, this person makes me uncomfortable and I kick them out of my house. It doesn't matter if I'm the same mom and dad with you. I don't give, mm -hmm. I don't care if my daughter is not comfortable, but it's because I've had that conversation with her. Mm -hmm. My mother didn't have that conversation with me. And I'm yeah. sure a lot of parents are not having that conversation with their children. Mm -hmm. So from a young age, because I know the culture that we have. So mm -hmm. I made sure that you know, I am having that conversation and that open relationship with my daughter so mm -hmm. that if something happens or she sees red flags, like for instance, there was a time that I traveled and um, they go to data at around MBI every Saturday and Sunday. Mm -hmm. And the driver didn't 
pick her up because of whatever reason. So we had to get a new taxi driver to go pick up Khadija. Mm -hmm. And when the taxi driver arrived, Khadija didn't know her. Khadija was like, I don't know you. I'm not going into your car. Mm -hmm. And the taxi driver was like, but your aunt sent me. She's like, yes, but you need to call my aunt for me to actually verify that my aunt sent you before I go into your car. My mother told me not to go with anyone that I don't know. Mm -hmm. So she, the taxi driver called my sister and she was like, did you send this driver to come pick me up? And then she said, yes. And she was like, okay, then I can go, but I'm not mm -hmm. going. So these are conversations that we need to have with our daughters mm -hmm. and we shouldn't blame them for things that happen to them. It's not their fault. No. If we're not talking to them, if something bad happens to them, somehow we blame the mother or we blame the child that Momoko Utal Bopam. That's not how mm -hmm. things operate. Mm -hmm. Predators don't ask for consent. Mm -hmm. And children don't even understand a lot of times what's happening with their bodies when you're doing these things to them. No. We only hear about the cases that go bad, whether someone dies or someone ends up in a hospital. Mm -hmm. Those are the only times we hear about molestation, but it's happening every single day sometimes right under our noses. And we, rather than saying that we should teach our daughters to be um, this or that, we should teach our sons to behave. Exactly. Our male children exactly. need to understand that this is unacceptable. They need to understand that a woman's body is her sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And if she didn't share that body with you, you have no right whatsoever to touch that body. And people need to also understand that um, we need to start bashing women. Like every time a woman comes out and says that something bad happened to her and mm -hmm. we say Chagala or Momoko Utal Bopa or for mm -hmm. some weird reason Jigenbi Ki Hamnani Dafa Nekon Aki Dafa Nekon Aki Dafa Nekwa Deng Neka or definitely Tok Tok Chi La Def so because mm -hmm. of that Lumo want to dig Just because man, I went around sleeping with so and so and so doesn't mean that if someone rapes me, it's not true. It's it, yeah, it's still rape. Come on, understand what I mean. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, but then a lot of times, like I think this is like the first time that I'm having a conversation like this because a lot of times I know the consequences of mm -hmm. you know some talking and the like talk online about sexual violence or rape or all of this. Like it's something that's very personal to me. Mm -hmm. Because being a child, right, like I said, it every single day felt mm -hmm. like rape to me. Mm -hmm. So to me, it triggers, like, it's not because I don't care. That's not why I don't talk about it publicly. Mm -hmm. It's because a lot of times I'm triggered by my own experiences. Yeah. And, and as a and result on of that. that on, on that topic of being triggered, Jaha, doing this work, um, you know, it's, it, it's very sensitive and very heavy and it must be very taxing uh, for you because you're engaged in a lot of, you know, a, a lot of really just hard topics. How do you stress and look after yourself? Um, God, I have some of the most amazing friends. Um, my best friend, Hadi, and I talk like three hours a day. And um, um, Hadi is like my lifeline. And, um, you know, like I get to take everything in and then I pour it all on her when I come home. And when I'm alone in my room and someone like Sana Sar, for instance, Sana, I'm sorry if you're watching this. I know that a lot of people don't know that we are friends, but you're actually one of my, he's my therapist. So whenever things go really, really bad, I reach out to Sana Sar. Sana knows more about me than probably any Gambian. Aside from my best friend, I think Sana knows more about me than anyone else because I don't hide anything from him. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm having those moments of self-doubt, when I'm having those moments of, isolation and not knowing what to do or just scared and I'm a very emotional and sensitive person a lot of people don't know that about me I'm super sensitive and I'm very vulnerable I cry a lot and I make a big deal out of everything and um, but I people don't see that so a lot of times when I go out in communities and when I'm doing this work mm -hmm. um, yes it's a different persona that comes out and mm -hmm. that's when people see strength but when I come back home Mm -hmm. I'm usually very, very vulnerable and mm -hmm. um, I'm usually, you know, and I have an amazing team at Safe Hands for Girls um, from Safe Mati Jao to Lisa to the entire team that we have in that office. It's more than just a working relationship, but we are family and mm -hmm. they've had my back. They've stood by me. They've been through everything with me and I rely on them for strength. Mm -hmm. And there are days when I can't do it, when I can't go to the field. And they never complain. They pick up where I left off and they take it. 
when I come with the crazy ideas and the big ideas that no one thinks we can implement, they're there. And Alaji Manka, someone who I met through this work, but has become more like family to me. Like, I feel like these people genuinely know who I am because a lot of Gambians don't know me. I mean, they see what they see on social media and they make up their own ideas of who they think I am. But the people that I've been fortunate to have in my life, the people that are close to me, are the reason, like, I feel like one of the reasons why, like, an activist and I were recently talking about mental health Mm -hmm. and the days when you ask yourself, why am I living? Like, I've had that. I've been suicidal multiple times throughout my life. Mm -hmm. And I still have my bad days and I still have my good days. And, um, but these are the silent pains that we go through that we don't admit, that we don't talk about. And I think for someone like me, because a lot of times if you follow me on Snapchat, you see that I travel on business class and that I'm sitting with presidents and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. You probably think that my life is perfect, but I can 100% tell you that I have one of the most fucked up lives that I know. Like nothing in my life is perfect. It's only what you see on social media, but it's only the people that are close to me that can understand and see that. And I am grateful for that because Mm -hmm. you need support. You need if you're going to put yourself out there like that, make sure you're surrounded by positivity. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're surrounded by love. And my online community is also amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said earlier, like the people like Auntie Tukulur, Mama Lingier, these are women that I, exactly, these are women that I look up to. And like sometimes when I'm feeling down and I'm like, these people actually do believe in me. So what right do I have to Mm -hmm. like, you know, complain or, and I've been very blessed as well. I've been very, very fortunate to have the platforms that I do, the access that I have in the world, as well as the resources that I'm able to tap into mm-hmm. and um, the network. So I've been very, very fortunate as well. But, you know, I've, um, like I said, I have my days that I'm up and I have my days that I'm very down. Yeah. Jaha, thank you so much. We have gone way over time, but thank you very much. I wish I could hug you right now. I'm sending you a virtual hug. Um, love you lots. Good luck and Thank congratulations you. with everything you're doing. We are so proud. Um, and I hope that everybody watching as well will help um, and, and join you in um, your fight. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for watching. And for everyone that sent in their questions, I am so sorry we won't be able to read them out, but I will make sure I get them to you, Jaha, and you can respond um, to them. Thank you, everybody, for spending some of your Saturday with me. As always, remember to like and follow our pages on Facebook and Instagram at Stories from the Continent. Thank you. See you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, how do I go off? Leave. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Hadi and I'm a journalist and communication specialist. I believe that as Africans, we should be in charge of every narrative coming out of Africa. We have a lot of positive stories to tell and share with the world, and I'm determined to use my platform to make that a reality. This is why I teamed up with the Fatter Network to bring you a brand new show, Stories from the Continent,